So for our stroke patients to get back to the tasks they used to do, our therapy needs to target neuroplasticity. But what specific factors, what makes the difference in allowing our therapy to do that? That's what's coming up, let's dive in. Hey guys, I'm Khalid, welcome back to Clinical Physio. So when our patient has a neurological insult like a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, Damage to the nerves means damage to the neural pathways, the messaging system that allows our brain to send messages to our hands, to our feet, in order to do certain tasks and activities. However, our brain has this amazing ability to reorganize and remodel itself, especially after injury, and that's called neuroplasticity. By engaging our patients in physiotherapy, neuroplasticity allows the brain to almost relearn movements and skills by forming new neural pathways and new synaptic connections the more the patient engages in our therapy tasks and activities. It's like learning to play the piano. The more we play, the more neural pathways get sent between our brain and our hand so that we get better at playing the piano. And the amazing thing is that research shows our brain actually prioritizes this relearning on the affected side or the affected limbs after a stroke. Let's look at this research from Dikoff Krebs et al in 2017, where they used functional MRI scans to look at brain activity when moving limbs after a stroke. So on the right hand side here, we have control groups. That's patients who have had no neurological insult at all. And we can see a moderate amount of activity on the functional MRI when moving the limbs. On the left side, we then actually have patients who have had a stroke. When they move their unaffected side, again, we can see a moderate amount of activity, but when they move their affected side, huge amounts of activity on the functional MRI. Once again, demonstrating that our brain prioritizes the affected side when it comes to that relearning. Clear demonstration that if we can really get our patient to reuse those neural pathways, it's going to make a difference in their rehab. But what are the key factors? What do we actually have to focus on in our therapy? Well, Klein and Jones in 2008 highlighted these in the 10 key principles of neuroplasticity that will make the difference when we incorporate them into our therapy. So let's dive into these. So factor number one, use it or lose it. This simple principle demonstrates that neuroplasticity works both ways. If we don't engage in certain tasks and activities, those neural pathways die off. If we stop playing the piano, we forget how to play the piano. So it's really important in our rehab that we focus on those daily tasks with our patients to make sure that we keep reinforcing those neural pathways to make sure they don't lose it. Factor number two, use it and improve it. This is quite simply the opposite of factor number one. If we engage our patient in activities that either utilize cognitive pathways, language-based pathways, or physical pathways, it will mean that the patient is able to regenerate those synaptic connections and get those skills and activities back into their function. So factor number three is specificity. We need to practice task-specific training in order to generate strong and specific neural pathways. So if our patient wants to get back to writing, there might be some benefit from picking up a mobile phone or picking up a pair of scissors, but to actually get their fingers to do the right things, they need to be practicing picking up a pen and writing on a piece of paper. So get specific, think about what your patient actually needs to do and incorporate that task into your rehab. So factors four and five combined together, repetition and intensity matters. So if we want to learn to play a particular song on the guitar, if we practice it once, does that mean we're a master at it? Absolutely not. We need to put in hours of practice to get better at that activity. And it's exactly the same with our rehab. In fact, perhaps even more so because of the neurological insult on the brain, meaning that we really have to put in extra work to get those neural pathways back. Now, unfortunately, the research hasn't shown a specific amount of time or a specific intensity that needs to be followed to achieve this. However, other pieces of research has definitely demonstrated that more is better. So Chow Han et al in 2012 completed a study where they took 32 patients who were approximately 40 days post-stroke. All of those patients engaged in therapy five days a week for six weeks. However, they separated the patients into the group so that some patients did one hour of therapy a day, some patients did two hours of therapy a day, and some patients did three hours of therapy a day. 
Now, when they looked at the outcomes for these patients on the Fugel-Meyer scale, the three-hour therapy group had a significant 11.5 points difference on the one-hour group. And that's a very significant increase on that particular scale. This is often one of the biggest challenges in healthcare. How can we get our patients to do the right amount of therapy in the right setting for a long enough period of time? So this is where we can get creative. Can we ask other members of the medical team to ask the patient to actually reach for their own cup or reach for their own knife and fork when eating? Can we ask family members to keep asking the patients questions to engage their cognitive function, but also to get their speech working? Effectively, all of the different things we can do are just there to make sure that more is better in terms of repetition and intensity. Factor number six, time matters. This principle simply demonstrates that our brain is more likely to make greater and more significant changes in the acute stage after a stroke than in the more chronic stages. And I suppose that makes sense. The brain probably knows that it has to make big changes after such a significant insult. And this is where we see stroke guidelines, such as that from the Royal College of Physicians, demonstrating that early intervention for stroke is paramount for recovery. But that doesn't mean that patients in the chronic stage can't make changes. It just might be more difficult. So therefore, get on it as soon as possible with your rehab. Factor number seven, salience matters. Salience is how worthy or how important a particular task is to our patient. So if I was to ask you to do a particular task and tell you that you were going to get a reward at the end of doing that task, would you be more likely to do it? Of course you would. It becomes more important to you. And it's exactly the same with our patients. So how do we improve salience? Well, first of all, we need to incorporate cognitive activity into the task. Make it a learned task. Make sure the patient understands what they have to do and get them to actually think about the activity. Second of all, goal setting. If you're able to communicate with the patient or perhaps their family, think about those things that are really important to the patient and highlight to the patient during the rehab that the particular task you're doing is going to contribute to that goal. Factor number eight, age matters. This principle suggests that neuroplasticity occurs more readily in a younger brain. Kula et al. in 2003 analyzed data from over 2,000 stroke patients. They found that those aged 55 or younger achieved 67% of maximal possible improvement. Those older than 55 only achieved 50% of maximum possible improvement. This demonstrates to us that older stroke patients can make improvements. We just might have to work harder for longer in order to help them achieve it. Factor number nine, transference or generalization. This principle suggests that one type of training could transfer itself into different activities that require similar skills. Kartik Babu et al. 2022 demonstrated that core stability training led to improvements in sitting balance, standing balance, and the ability to transfer. So how can we think about this in our therapy? Well, perhaps we can think about what muscles are involved in similar activities. For example, the bulbar muscles around the throat and larynx. If we practice singing, it could also lend itself to swallowing. And factor number 10, interference. We sometimes think of this as developing bad habits as plasticity in one area can affect another. We sometimes call it maladaptive neuroplasticity. The most simple example and most common one you'll probably see is patients who have a foot drop where they have a lack of dorsiflexion. They might develop maladaptive habits like having to flex their hips in order to lift their foot off the floor rather than trying to improve dorsiflexion. So quite simply, therapists have to look out for these signs of interference and make sure that they can try and prevent them becoming a long-term habit. So guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please be sure to smash that like button subscribe to the channel and check us out at clinicalphysio.com for even more of our resources. I'm Khalid, we'll see you really soon here on Clinical Physio.